Um, I'm Marina Miller, um, and I did my SYP on reflexive visual sociology. Um, so just for starters, reflexive um, visual sociology, by definition, um, since sociology is the study of um, society and humans within society, um, visual sociology is therefore um, the scientific study of society through visual works, um, including many things, but especially photographs, which is what I focused on. Um, so just to give a short history of my topic, um, visual sociology really um, came into being for many reasons, but especially since um, photography and sociology um, ultimately have the same birth date. Um, both came to being in 1850. Um, this man here on the left is Comte, who founded um, the study of sociology, um, driven from a desire to sort of understand humanity um, and how humans interact within a society scientifically. Um, so then, here on the right, um, is Daguerre, who around the same time that Comte was experimenting um, with his foundations of sociology, um, invented metal, print plate, metal plate printing, um, which was really um, the beginning of a movement of photography um, through which he exposed light onto um, light reactant pieces of metal. So, um, Almost immediately after Daguerre invented photography and photography became circulated, it grew wildly popular um, as it was cheaper and quicker than painting, um, but more descriptive and powerful than the written word. Um, documentary photography among artistic photography was a huge branch of the field. Um, this here is uh, Sharbat Gula. Um, I'm sure you've all seen this picture before. Um, she's an, Afga an Afghani girl um, who was captured during the Afghanistan war in the 80s. Um, and this photograph has been known as the most famous um, documentary photograph ever printed in National Geographic and perhaps one of the most recognized in history. Um, so really the first um, I guess sort of founder of documentary photography, um, also very famous in American history is Jacob Rees, who in 1890 um, went into the tenement houses of New York City, which at the time were full of immigrants, um, were very, very hazardous. Um, many people were crowded into tiny rooms, the conditions were very unhygienic. Um, and he emerged with a series of photographs that he called How the Other Half Lives, um, based on the quote, one half of the world does not know how the other half lives. Um, and really, through circulating his photographs in newspapers um, and his book, he um, brought a huge amount of social change um, due to the fact that people otherwise really wouldn't have the chance to see these images. Um, and the more wealthy people in New York City and the lawmakers and the politicians otherwise had no idea what the conditions were like. Um, and also part of the reason his photographs were so powerful is because if you look at these three images right here, you can imagine how seeing these printed in a newspaper would be so much more powerful than reading the sentence, tenement houses are hazardously overcrowded, um, or something of the like. So. A couple decades later, Walker Evans, um, under similar circumstances, however, a little different, um, traveled out west to document the faces of the Great Depression through farmers. Um, and what he did was, um, fo he focused on faces, um, just people who were impacted by the Great Depression, farmers that were growing food but not selling it, starving, um, losing their farms, etc. Um, and by bringing back these human faces, um, he really sort of incited like a human connection in people. Um, once again, the, the wealthier politicians east um, could see these faces that they otherwise would have no chance to see. Um, and so he also incited a huge amount of social change, um, brought a lot of sort of economic stimulus out west. Um, so from there I looked at sort of um, combining the two purposefully rather than just sort of documentary photography. Um, and I looked through a lot of sort of scholarly research on um, visual sociology itself. Um, this quote is from an article by Howard S. Becker. Um, it says, from its beginning, photography has been used as a tool for the exploration of society. At first, some photographers used cameras to record far off societies that their contemporaries would otherwise never see. And later, aspects of their own society their contemporaries had no wish to see. So. There are dozens of reasons that cameras are really effective tools for studying society. Um, the four that I really focused on that I felt was m were most important um, were, first of all, cameras are easy to use. Um, 
anyone who has the ability to press a button can take a picture. Um, you don't need a complicated camera or anything. I use disposables for mine. Um, and also oftentimes in um, sociology, um, research methods, um, people use really complicated tools um, which often sort of skew the results because the subjects have issues. Um, second, photographs are easy to dissect, meaning um, looking at a photograph, um, it's pretty easy to understand what the photographer meant to capture, um, what they were sort of looking for, and why they held the camera the way they did and why they focused on what they did. Um, third, photographs are regarded as inherently truthful. Um, if you take a photograph from its source and it hasn't been edited, um, you believe that it captures something that's real because that's the nature of photography. Um, you can't skew real life, um, especially through how you capture it. And while you can sort of change the perspective, you can't change what you're ultimately capturing. And finally, um, all untrained photographers exhibit what is called user bias, which is sort of the phenomenon that um, anyone who hasn't really taken a lesson in photography or sort of like studied the cliches of photography will automatically be drawn to um, what they find interesting or what they find beautiful. So from there I looked at um, sort of more contemporary projects that combined cameras and sociology. Um, this is Born into Brothels, um, which was a project put together by Zana Brisky, who traveled into the red light districts of Calcutta, India. Um, and at first she went to um, take pictures of the poverty there and the lifestyles, but um, after a while sort of made friends with the children and decided instead to have them use her camera and them capture their lives. Um, and what she found through doing so was um, while she as a tourist sort of focused on the more negative aspects of the society that she otherwise wasn't used to, um, the children had already sort of accepted this as their lifestyle and instead focused on the more positive parts or just the parts of their lives that they were used to. Um, like domestic tasks, the bottom right corner, um, their animals, their friends, their family. Um, the second project I looked at um, is still going. Um, it's called Critical Exposure, um, which seeks to um, sort of reach out to high schoolers in impoverished areas, um, including DC, Philadelphia, and Baltimore, um, however it continues growing. Um, and their mission is to have children um, sort of point out the aspects of their life that they feel need to be changed and need to be reformed. Um, so here I just pulled two images from their website. Um, this one on the left um, shows an out of order urinal um, and the quote says, although we are used to visuals such as this in our school, they affect our thoughts daily. We the students of Stowe Rocks High School feel as though we do not deserve better, therefore we are less inclined to strive for better. Um, and then here on the right it's kind of harder to tell, but um, it's a picture of a chair um, through a window, and the window has a bullet hole in it. Um, and the quote says, taking this picture, I thought of the student who is most likely sitting in that seat when the firearm was pulled. School safety is supposed to be number one, and people wonder why students can't focus or learn in these environments. So just like Jacob Reese, um, just like Walker Evans, these students, while they haven't been trained in capturing their lives, are just showing people their lives through their own point of views. Um, and school administrators really like get a sense of what needs to be reformed. And uh, critical exposure does a fantastic job in sort of bringing an aid to schools in need. So, oh, sorry. Um, so the third and final project I looked at, well, I looked at several more, um, but the one I really extensively looked at um, was called sh also Shooting for Peace. Um, I couldn't find any available visuals online, um, but I went to see it at the um, PBD Museum of Harvard in Cambridge, um, and I believe it's still up if you have any interest in going. Um, but it was curated by Alex Fatal, um, who with a crew of people went into Colombia um, and really like sought out um, the child expatriates of war and had them document their lives and document themselves. And he found actually um, what the children focused on the most were sort of their sense of self, um, 
and how their community affected them, how they affected their community, um, things along those lines. So it was really wonderful to look at. Um, so after pulling together all of these existing projects, um, all of my scholarly sources, um, I really found um, that a lot of children um, universally throughout all of these projects sort of became drawn to similar things. Um, a lot of them, regardless of the prompt or who is conducting the research, um, really focused on friends and family, um, a lot focused on material possessions, um, sense of self. So for my project, um, I sought out three groups of students. Um, these three groups changed a lot just because making connections is difficult. Um, but I ultimately ended up with three groups of students, um, one from Nicaragua, one from Mississippi, and one from Newton. Um, and for each of these students, I brought disposable cameras or sent disposable cameras. Um, and I told them, please photograph things you would most like to show a stranger that is visiting from far away. What about your neighborhood is most important to you? What about your neighborhood is most beautiful to you? Um, so after I sent out these cameras and before I got back the film, I sort of made a list of what I expected I would see. Um, I thought family and friends would be a huge category. I thought material possessions, um, possibly religion, um, cool places, I guess, um, places that children felt reflected nicely on themselves or made themselves look popular, um, and finally a sense of self. But I wasn't sure how that would be explored. So here are some photos I got back. Um, I divided them into categories, the first being family and friends. Um, this top left one is from Mississippi, bottom right is Nicaragua. Um, as you can see, probably someone's dad, um, someone's friend, or possibly baby sibling. Um, here's some more. This is from Newton. Um, top left is um, the child's sister, again from Mississippi. Then the bottom left is, again, Nicaragua, bottom right is Newton. Um, possessions. Actually, um, probably not surprisingly, I got the most photographs of material possessions from the child in Newton, um, the least from the child in Nicaragua, um, and Mississippi was sort of in between. Um, this on the left is the only one I got from Nicaragua, shows the girl with all of her toys. Um, on the right is from Mississippi. Um, and then going clockwise, Newton, Mississippi, Newton again, and Mississippi again. So I looked at beauty also, which um, I didn't receive as much as I thought, um, maybe just because children were more um, sort of driven to capture what they thought I would enjoy rather than what they enjoyed. Um, but this is from, these are from all three locations, Mississippi, um, Nicaragua, and Newton on the bottom. Um, and actually I thought the, the most interesting out of all of these was the one from Nicaragua. Um, for a while I wasn't entirely sure what it was meant to capture, um, but it turns out the child was really fascinated. This is, um, the person in the photograph is a student who went to Nicaragua, um, and they loved the color of her hair. So they took a picture of her braid, um, which I thought was really fascinating. Um, so, um, I looked at religious and cultural importance. Um, again, not as many photographs as I was hoping. A lot from Mississippi, um, none really from Nicaragua. Um, these are both from Mississippi. Um, this on the left is a calendar. Um, I guess the, um, the children or one child from Mississippi um, is Korean. So this was at her house. And then on the right, the Last Supper. Um, here's sort of a religious woodwork of sorts. And then on the bottom, more from Mississippi. Um, and then self. Um, this actually was the most fascinating. Um, Thinking about a child, I guess, it's hard to sort of understand their conception of self and how they view themselves because they're so young. Um, all of my, um, all of the students I reached out to were between the ages of seven and ten. Um, so none of them really had um, that sort of like grown up sense of self, but at the same time they were sort of in that transitional period where they sort of understood themselves. This one is from Nicaragua, actually. Um, it's kind of hard to tell. I don't know if you can see up there. Um, on the left is the side of their face. Um, on the right is a mirror, um, and if you look really closely, you can see the reflection in the mirror. Um, so I love the way this was framed first off. Also, the idea was just fascinating. And then this is from Mississippi and Nicaragua, both the same photograph, more or less, them holding the cameras in front of their faces and taking a picture of them smiling. Um, 
so yeah, it was great. Um, and then also, I just looked at cool locations, um, places that either they enjoyed or that made them like seem like interesting people. Um, the top left is the Target in Newton, I guess, or Natick. Um, bottom right is an ice cream stand from Mississippi. So, in conclusion, um, my senior year project um, was difficult at times. Um, it was really hard to make connections. It was really hard to keep connections. Um, as a high schooler, I guess people are less prone to sort of um, accept me reaching out, um, especially since I ultimately like strive to find people through schools and a lot of school officials are busy with end of the year things, um, more focused on their students obviously than me, which is understandable. Um, but I kept finding new places. Um, I ended up finding a connection to Newton through a friend, um, Mississippi through a friend, and the Nicaragua trip. Um, but I definitely am in love with this topic. Um, I hope to keep working through it. Hopefully someday I'll be able to broaden my horizons, um, reach outside of North America even. But I have a feeling no matter where I look, I'll sort of bring back pictures that further prove my thesis, just because of the nature of user bias and um, visual sociology. So. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Did you run? I have two. Mm -hmm. One, well, the first one is um, which came first, if it's even possible to say, interest in photography or interest in sociology? Definitely the interest in photography. Um, but actually, I don't know if this is like going too far in my inspiration for this project. Um, but this summer, I went to Kenya. Um, with a group of students from Berkeley School of Music. Um, and their, um, I guess, mission was to um, provide cultural connections through music. Um, and so I really fell in love with the idea of combining my art with um, connecting with people around the world because creativity, I like, strongly believe, is really just naturally inset. So I guess photography, but kind of a little of both. So, um, so the second one is come into difficulty with, or do you think that maybe some difficulty getting subjects had to do with the fact that they were children and the fact that there was going to be an image that was kept? Yes, definitely. They were actually, um, I was in contact for a while with um, students from Northern Maine and students from Kentucky, um, and both of which required enormous amounts of consent. Um, so ultimately those fell through just because the teachers couldn't connect with me personally enough to allow me to use their children. So. Have you been to Louisiana and Never. So. This is all contact. Yeah. Mm hmm So. So one part of the process, as I mm -hmm. understand it, is editing. Yeah. How did you choose? What were some of the the choices you made for the the guiding principles you used in making choices about the images that you shared with us today? Um, well, I gathered, I want to say roughly around 100 photos total. Um, and a lot of them were sort of repetitive. Um, most of the ones from Newton were of technology or material possessions. Um, but I sort of just tried to um, take a broad selection um, just because a lot of them were so different. Um, a lot of them really showed the, um, the individual children's sort of um, sense, but I would have loved to show all of them, but I was pressed for time, so. Yeah. Actually, um, if you go to my website in the next couple of days, I'll hopefully be able to post mon more of them. You've for really seen all of them. I have. How did, that, how did they, as a, as a whole, Um, I don't know. I mean, looking through them was absolutely unbelievable. It was just like so real being able to see these. Um, it's also just amazing um, what these children are capable of doing um, because as far as I know, none of them, I mean, none of them have taken photography classes. As far as I know, none of them have really had a lot of experience handling cameras. Um, so these are just, I just thought they were brilliant. It was just amazing to look through these kind of things and just some of the shots they took were so beautiful um, some of them were really well lit even though they were taken with like CVS brand cameras so it's just it's amazing how much I sort of underestimated the potential and how they proved me wrong so 
Yeah. So, like, this is where I have a couple of questions. So the first one was, um, you know, you, you said you felt like you saw a lot of stuff that supported your thesis. Mm -hmm. Did you see a few things that were like, oh, that kind of, I mean, usually there's the exception that proves the rule, where there's things you saw in the photographs where you're like, oh, I didn't think I'd see that at all. Yeah, um, I mean, I was I was really fascinated by the sense of self ones. Um, I wasn't sure I would get any, um, and then from the ones I did, it was interesting how. Um, actually, I guess the majority were from Nicaragua, um, and the minority were from Newton. Whereas, the opposite um, was true for material possessions. The majority are from Newton, the least from Nicaragua. Um, so, of course, I mean, looking through the photos, there are there is sort of um, an exception. Like you can sort of tell which is from where, sort of. Um, you can see the differences between the children. Um, so it's not as, I guess, universal as it could be, but there were still many subjects that universally proved it. The other thing I was thinking about, I mean, I looked a little bit ahead you know, on the website yeah. yesterday. Um, and the idea, like, now you watch people and they give, like, three-year-olds their phones with a camera. Exactly. It almost feels like the window for doing this kind of research is going to close because the fact you get yeah. a seven-year-old who have already taken. I mean, I was thinking about like when we were kids, mm -hmm. like, you didn't get a camera until you didn't touch a camera until you were eight because the film costs a bunch of money. Yeah, and exactly. Then, and then you had to pay to get it developed. Your parents, like your parents didn't let you touch the camera until you were five. Whereas now, I mean, like, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. what? Yeah, and the the existence of digital photography has really made photography accessible to everyone, um, which I guess is a good thing, um, just because it's a great way to capture um, your lives. Um, but it does also sort of withdraw from the art of photography. I guess the like sense of being able to study it as a social um, concept. But um, yeah, I mean, I, re I tried to reach out to the youngest kids possible that would still sort of understand my prompt. Um, but yeah, maybe if I traveled outside of the United States, I'd find more um, children less exposed to photography. But it seems like, I think in a lot of countries, like, they don't have a lot of stuff that they have yeah. Phones. yeah, that's true. Like that's the one thing they do have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but even if you think about um, what most people use the cameras on their cell phones for, it's to capture things they see that are interesting or things that are unique um, events that don't occur all the time. So it's sort of along the same lines. How old were they again, the kids? Um, they were all around age seven through ten. I think the Nicaragua kids were slightly younger. Um, the rest were all about in that age range. You just mentioned your prompts. I was I was impressed with the questions that you presented to the oh, kids thank in, guiding you. The, in guiding their work. Uh -huh. Having received their work, how how has their work made you think of those questions differently, or how might you edit them if you were to to, to do this one? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think actually I might have considered taking out um, the second question, "What do you find most beautiful?" or the third, I guess, um, just because. I feel like it'd be interesting to see how that came into play without me asking them to think about it. Um, I think I think asking them um, what's most interesting um, was helpful, just so that they wouldn't take pictures of whatever. Although maybe if they weren't given a prompt, they would do the same thing anyway. Um, I tried to just sort of keep it universal by giving them this one prompt, but it'd be interesting to see how they would take different pictures without one. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you.